good morning, good day, or good evening, depending on what time it is where you are right now. Today we're looking at Luke 13, verses 10 through 17, the healing of the woman on the Sabbath. Before we go very far, let's actually read the text for this video. Luke 13, verses 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, Come on one of those days and be cured, but not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he said this, all of his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. If you're new here, you're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and I've been teaching seminary with Fuller Theological Seminary and other institutions around the world for the past 20 to 30 years. And the goal of this challenge is to take what I've been teaching in the seminaries and bring it to YouTube so that anyone, anywhere, anytime can make use of these videos. So if you find these useful and encouraging and helpful, please give it a thumbs up. Let other people know about it by hitting that share button and definitely subscribe to the channel. That would really help me out very much. Thanks. In the last video, I mentioned that Luke gave particular emphasis to the poor and criticism of the rich. That's not quite right. Luke gives particular emphasis to those who were on the fringes of society or were not powerful figures within that culture. So the poor, the sick, the outcast, and women all fit within this wider category. In regard to women, interpreters have always seen Luke as being more sympathetic to their stories in his gospel. He includes more accounts of women in his gospel than the others. All told, he has 42 stories or passages that are about women. 23 of them are unique to his gospel. This is one of those stories. His attention to women is related to one of the main themes in his gospel, the liberating nature of God's reign. In the first sermon that Luke records for us of Jesus, it takes place in Nazareth. And in that sermon, Jesus preached, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's in Luke chapter 4. Our story in chapter 13 opens with Jesus teaching in a synagogue. The reference to Jesus being in the synagogue and teaching on the Sabbath creates a connection between his first sermon in Nazareth and what he's about to do here. And these themes that were introduced in chapter 4 of liberation are now going to be played out in this chapter. In 13.1, we are told that there is a woman who has a spirit that has crippled her for 18 years, and she was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. Notice all the attention that Luke gives to this woman's condition. She has a spirit that has crippled her. 18 years, she was bent over and unable to stand up straight. The four ways he describes her condition here is part of a Greek rhetorical device known as ekphrasis. In order to emphasize her condition, he describes it in multiple ways. In other words, Luke wants to draw our attention to just how bad her condition was. The second thing I want to bring out here is the link between her physical condition and her moral or spiritual condition. In Greek culture, Aristotle argued that it was possible to infer a person's character from their physical features body and soul were linked together. A person's passions and desires would be exhibited in their bodily traits. 
So someone bent over or crippled would be associated with a poor moral or spiritual state. This gave rise to the ancient pseudoscience of physiognomy, which carries down to this day. Physiognomy from the Greek word physis meaning nature and nomo meaning to judge or interpret something. And this still carries over today. Watch any movie and the bad guy is often portrayed as someone with a scarred face or some bodily deformity while the hero almost always has impeccably good looks. Even if they suffer major injury in a fight scene, they might get their lip cut, but that will all be gone in the next scene. But I digress and we need to return to ancient Greece. After Aristotle, a book comes along called The Physiognomies, written by Pseudo-Aristotle. And in that book, they associate a large, strong back with a strong moral character. Someone with a weak and a narrow back suffered from a very weak and feeble moral character. In other words, this woman's outer physical crookedness was the result of an inner spiritual or moral condition. These prejudices not only were part of Greek culture, but they come down to us today. Within Jewish culture, illness and handicaps like this were often ascribed to sin. Not always, but often. The story of the blind man in John chapter 9 is a great example of this. His disciples ask him, Teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? When Luke mentioned that she had a spirit that had crippled her, literally she has a spirit of weakness or disabling, he may have been activating some of those prejudices. At the same time, to speak of someone having a spirit of in regard to their illness was a common way to refer to various forms of illness without actually saying that they had some sort of spiritual possession. It's a rather open and ambiguous way to speak about her condition. But the dividing line between how they saw illness as either a spiritual or a physical cause was rather fuzzy to define, as we're going to see in our story here. In 1312, we are told two specific things right at the start. First off, Jesus saw her, and then he called her. Jesus initiates the action of the story by not only noticing her, but specifically calling her over. In Luke chapter 7, we have the story about the widow of Nain. And in that story as well, Luke tells us that when the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her. Like the widow from Nain, this woman doesn't appear to seek Jesus out specifically. Rather, he notices them and moves to help them. Woman, you are set free from your ailment. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on what Jesus says here because I think it's kind of important. The word used for ailment here is the same that he uses in 1311 when he talks about a spirit of disabling or weakness. And I think a little bit more literally it would be, woman, you have been set free from your weakness. The verb set free in Greek is apoluo, and it refers to allowing someone to leave someplace, to go away, to depart. It got extended from that physical action of walking away from someone to the idea of being divorced, to be set free from your husband and wife. You can walk away from them. Then it gets applied to being freed or pardoned from some sort of charge and then also to illnesses or painful conditions. You are set free from them. Ancient writers like this word, to loose or to be set free, and others that are similar to it to describe, for example, the removal of a curvature of the spine or being freed from some sort of illness. They also used it in reference to being freed from a demon's grip. So I was saying that these boundaries between a physical or a spiritual problem are often very, very fuzzy and difficult to define. Now, just to geek out a little bit more here, the verb set free, when Jesus says, woman, you have been set free, is in the perfect passive construction. I know I'm getting a little bit too technical here for our YouTube video. But in the New Testament, this particular verb form is often used to refer to an action that God has accomplished. Not that somebody did, but God did it. And it's often referred to in Greek grammars as a divine passive for this reason. The idea being here is that her healing was accomplished by God. Now keep that in mind because it's going to come back as an important point in a bit here. 
a moment ago, I said that when he referred to her illness, he referred to it as a spirit of weakness. But when he heals her, he just refers to her being set free from this weakness. No language of exorcism or anything like that along this line. It's just straight healing language. Just to confuse things a little bit more, when we reach 1316, he's going to refer to her illness as having been bound by Satan for 18 years. So we can see how these are fuzzy categories from our perspective as to what she was suffering from. If we go back to Jesus' sermon in Nazareth once again, Jesus proclaimed that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim release to the captives, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The actions in this story definitely enact what Jesus was preaching there in Nazareth. Another thing that's very, very interesting here is that the actions in this story seem to be a little bit out of order. After Jesus informs the woman of her healing, he lays her hands upon her and immediately she stood up. Normally in the gospel accounts, Jesus touched the person and then the healing takes place. The order is reversed here. Jesus pronounces her healed and then lays hands upon her and the healing seems to take place. But some commentators think that the laying on of hands here may have been more of a helpful action. After having been bent over for 20 years, he is now helping her to stand up straight once again. The woman's response here is almost immediate. She glorified God, and her response is one of the best responses to Jesus' healing in all of the Gospels. She immediately praises God. But the leader of the synagogue becomes indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath. This introduces our antagonist in the story, the leader of the synagogue. Now, an arche synagogue was most likely a wealthy patron in that village of the synagogue. He also most likely held administrative, liturgical, or other financial duties for that synagogue as well. Notice his criticism is not directed at Jesus, but at the people. They have come to be cured on the Sabbath. His concern is clear. He wants to preserve the sanctity of the Sabbath, but he misses what is taking place in the process. As a leader in that town and synagogue, which Jesus is not, he is just passing through, the leader of the synagogue wants to make sure that things are done properly, not only in this particular instance, but also in the future as well. His words are directed at the people there, to those he had authority over. By directing his words at them, he appears to be trying to persuade them to adhere to their accepted practices and not loosen things up. We're going to see how this comes into play in a bit as well. The problem is, is that we have no known laws or rabbinic practices that forbid healing on the Sabbath. In fact, there are several instances in the rabbinic writings where praying for a sick person was a practice to be taken place on the Sabbath. I mentioned that Luke uses a divine passive when Jesus said, you have been set free. This comes into play here, since God was not bound by the laws regarding the Sabbath. So this person's injunction that they can only come on other days, not on the Sabbath to be healed, doesn't apply because God did the action here. This is an instance where grammar actually pays off. In verse 15, Jesus responded to them and he said, you hypocrites. Now Jesus' response here is particularly harsh. This intensifies the conflict in the passage and it moves it or shifts it from the leader rebuking the people to a conflict between Jesus and the leader of the synagogue. Jesus then employs a common form of argument, from the lesser to the greater. If this is the case for a farm animal, isn't it even greater or more important for a human being? In 3.16, Jesus asks, Ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, have been set free? When he calls her a daughter of Abraham, this sets up a contrast to being bound by Satan. But it's also a very, very important covenantal term. She is now referred to as one of Abraham's children, a promise that goes back to Genesis chapter 12. Later in Luke, Jesus is going to call the short tax collector Zacchaeus, another outcast whose physical appearance would have raised questions about his moral nature, 
a son of Abraham. So you see how Luke is kind of reversing the physical appearances of people and bestowing these great covenantal terms upon them. In 317, when he had said all this, his opponents were put to shame. Remember back when I said that the leader of the synagogue was addressing the people. He wanted to persuade them to follow him. Now in the closing line of the story, we return to the people once again. And we see how this story was also one of a public dispute. The leader of the synagogue wanted the people to maintain their accepted practices. If they were to allow someone to heal on the Sabbath, who knows where it will end. It's a slippery slope that only leads to perdition. Perdition. There's a term that we don't use too much anymore. So at one level, this story is a story of the woman being healed and the reversal of her fortunes from being seen as morally questionable to now a daughter of Abraham. On the other hand, it's also a public debate between this visiting preacher and the leader of the synagogue. They're debating over our practice, not this particular instance here alone, but also what are going to be the customary practices in that community going forward. The recognition by the people there is mentioned by Luke to indicate that Jesus has won this debate. This was a common feature in Greek literature as well. When someone won a debate, they would talk about how the others were silenced. In this particular case, what took place for this woman was now seen as valid, but it also most likely set up a precedent for how they were going to perceive the Sabbath in the future as well. Summary. Jesus' healing of this woman on the Sabbath drives home a couple of main points from Luke's Gospel. First, one of the main focuses of Jesus' ministry is the liberation of people from illness, sin, and oppressive conditions. Second, when our religious practices or interpretations restrain people, Jesus confronts that in a very head-on manner. You hypocrites. And third, the message of the New Covenant is one that releases captives and frees those who are oppressed, no matter what form that might take. Well, I think I'm about done here. Not that this is all that there is in this short story, but for now, I think I've pretty well wrapped this up. Till we meet again, peace. Peace.